Daggerfall released 25 years ago, and guess what? It's actually my favourite game in the series. Yeah, I said it. And this is coming from someone who played Morrowind first and didn't even touch Daggerfall until last year. But after a long bonding session with this phenomenal game over the course of the pandemic, Daggerfall has proved itself to me. So before we get started here, over the next several videos I will deconstruct every aspect of Daggerfall in an attempt not only to learn what made this great mid-90s immersive sim tick, but also to convince you why I think you should play it. Okay, first off, all footage for this video was recorded using the Unity version of the game, which is the superior version. All points made in this series are made with this version in mind, including all the bug fixes that it makes. There's gonna be a whole lot more reasons for Unity's supremacy, which I'll cover in a later video, but for now, sit back, grab some snacks, and prepare to experience your new obsession. The marketing guys at Bethesda knew exactly what they were selling when they put those words on the front of the box. Daggerfall offers a world larger than any other in the series, with more freedom and options for immersion than it had any right to have in 1996. It's a game where you can roleplay any single fantasy character that you can imagine, with little to no barriers. But before I spew over and over about how great the gameplay of Daggerfall is, we have to go to the beginning, to a time where Todd Howard was just a young man begging Bethesda to hire him. Let me in. Let me in. By the 1990s, Bethesda Softworks, which started from humble beginnings in its founder's garage, had grown to create a multitude of sports games. Not exactly what they're known for today, but they had also acquired the license to make games for the Terminator franchise, making them an action game company more than anything else. One of the lead designers and programmers there, Julian Lafay, began working on a personal project with a small team of co-workers, that project being a fantasy adventure game, inspired by tabletop RPG hobbies. We're talking Dungeons and Dragons and all that good stuff. That project would be known as the Elder Scrolls Chapter 1 Arena. Dubbed the father of the Elder Scrolls by fans, Julian Lafay began laying the groundwork with the early core concept being gladiatorial battles set in a quasi-medieval fantasy world, hence the game's name. In his initial idea, the player would choose a team to represent, with one notable option being called the Blades, which as we know would later become the name for the Emperor's personal bodyguard and spy network. Not long into development, Bethesda wanted the game to be so much more than just a Colosseum-based attorney. Taking inspiration from a variety of classic first-person computer role-playing games, Lafay's new plan was to take the limited mechanics of these so-called dungeon crawlers and expand them into an immersive world comprising of towns, cities, guilds, and vast wilderness. For 1992, this was not only ambitious, but by many within Bethesda, it was thought to be impossible. I mean the main consoles at the time were the SNES and the Sega Genesis. Even Doom was only a twinkle in John Carmack's eyes. So what Lefay was proposing must have sounded like a skooma induced hallucination. Regardless, work pressed on. Lefay's project was greenlit by management and his team grew. Just one year into development and disaster had already struck, with the unforeseen release of Ultima Underworld, the Stygian Abyss. Believe it or not based on this gameplay, but this game blew people away with just how fluid it was. Gone were the clunky mechanics of the dungeon crawlers that inspired Le Fay, replaced with true 3D environments with praise from critics for the immersion these offered. The team was dismayed by this new game's popularity, partially due to it being more technologically advanced than their alpha builds, but still they continued with the original plan as they had a card up their sleeves that Ultima Underworld hadn't played. That being the Elder Scrolls main strength all these years later, its scope. They had created a massive world with countless cities, towns and dungeons for the player to explore, in addition to its unique lore, introducing the continent of Tamriel and its many races. 
Despite Bethesda's inexperience with the fantasy genre and anything of this scale, in 1994, gamers could lay their hands on the first game in what we would know as the best-selling RPG franchise of all time. Arena was groundbreaking. Using procedural generation techniques, the player could visit bustling cities filled with NPCs, guilds, stores and taverns. They could travel a huge world, strolling through villages and towns looking for work and tips about the main quest. Or they could delve into deep and challenging dungeons. While it missed its vital release date of Christmas 1993, instead releasing in the far less desirable spring of 1994, it still continued to sell well over the course of the year, garnering a strong cult following. Combining that with the word of mouth around the computer RPG circles, an arena was a sleeper hit. Due to its inexperienced development, and despite that delay in release, Arena still came with a huge amount of bugs and glitches, a curse that continues to follow Bethesda Softworks to this day. Patches were sent out on floppy disks, fixing the majority of them, but in true Bethesda fashion, many were left to the community to fix in unofficial patches. While clunky by today's standards, the game was praised at the time for its cutting edge graphics and interactivity, and if you've played it, you'll know just how dire the RPG scene must have been at the time. Look, I enjoy Arena, really, I've actually been binging it since picking it up for this review, but boy oh boy is it unintuitive. Regardless of this, Arena was a landmark title in many ways, but also quite lacklustre in others. It was one of the first games to combine first person roleplaying with immersive sim design, but it could often feel more tedious and annoying than engrossing and fun. Nonetheless, the foundation for an amazing RPG series was there, and the development of a sequel began immediately after the surprising commercial success. This may have had something to do with this uh, kind of misleading box art, but have no fear. Where Arena failed to deliver with the scantily clad women, Daggerfall makes up for this with some grade A pixelated nudity. After Arena won a Game of the Year award, anticipation for a sequel into the world of Tamriel was running at an all-time high. In September 1993, Bethesda stated that campaign mods for Arena were planned to be released in 1994. While that never happened, the title of the game itself, The Elder Scrolls Chapter 1, The Arena, pretty much implied that Elder Scrolls was intended to be a series, instead of just a standalone game. Over on the Terminator side of the business, Bethesda had developed an in-house engine to rival id Tech's first-person shooter offerings. The X engine first displayed its modern features in Terminator Future Shock. Two impressive results, introducing a WASD control scheme and full mouse look, as well as complex, fully 3D levels. I've gotta say man, as a fan of classic shooters like Star Wars Dark Forces and of course Doom, Quake, Hex and so on, this game looks awesome. I actually really need to check it out. With this new 3D engine, LeFay's concerns over Arena's single plane of movement were removed. They now had the tools necessary to create the Elder Scrolls of their dreams. Okay, up until this point, all the information given in this video is pretty much common knowledge for the hardcore Elder Scroll fans like myself. But wanting to do this series right, I've been on a journey. A journey back in time. I've been trolling websites deep down in the web archive rabbit hole. During my adventures into the glamour of the late 90s internet, I have discovered a gem. An essay by fellow Elder Scroll fans, Frank Schlaub and Moritz Ernst Jacob. I'm sorry if I butchered those pronunciations. This essay brings together a ton of interviews and magazine articles written over the two-year development of Daggerfall, including interviews from Julian Le Fay and other top employees at Bethesda. All of my sources will be in the description, but I've taken out the key elements for this video. After Arena's release, lead designer Ted Peterson immediately began working on the story for the second Elder Scrolls game. Inspired by English literature such as Hamlet, he aimed to develop a plot that would unfold more and more throughout the next two years. Additional inspiration, especially for quests, came from a Dungeons & Dragons campaign that Peterson and his co-workers were playing around the time. Inspiration also came from other tabletop RPGs. For example, the idea for vampire clans in The Elder Scrolls came from a game of Vampire the Masquerade. 
Peterson aimed for a pen and paper like RPG experience, with a story that wasn't determined from the beginning, but would change according to your decisions, like a complex series of adventures leading to multiple resolutions. While Arena paved the way for a generic fantasy world, Daggerfall would flesh out the details in a more narrow geographic part of the world. For his story, he focused more on the history, characters and the politics and intrigues between them. There is no big showdown at the end, Peterson believed that the player should do what they want and when they want to. He even read all of the fan letters written to him regarding a sequel to further guide his process. The team were working hard on creating content for Daggerfall, and already by summer 1994, they could present the first results at that year's CES convention. An early idea set the game in and around Mournhold, the capital city of Morrowind province, but this was soon scrapped with the new location of the Iliac Bay and its surrounding countries. Daggerfall had no solid announcement as is typical today, instead information was leaked every now and then, and until Bethesda decided that Daggerfall was showable enough to make more buzz around it. This point was reached in late 1994, and kicked off with a Computer Gaming World magazine cover story about Daggerfall. Shortly after the article was published, Bethesda showed a trailer for Daggerfall at the Winter CES in 1995. Just absorb all that 90s nostalgia boys, this classic doesn't even need a VHS filter on it. This trailer explained parts of the story and showed Bethesda employees as well as staff of a local theatre group, supplemented with animated scenes. Rendering was done on a silicon graphics station to ensure sufficient quality. Publishers by that time were eager to have games in an interactive movie style, with lots of cutscenes telling the story throughout the game. PC Games Magazine pointed out that actually RPG fans weren't looking for interactive movies, but instead good gameplay. Even so, publishers tried to be fashionable and implement this new technology that was shown off in the Wing Commander series and would later become an integral part of the Command and Conquer series. The first wave of reports in magazines covered almost everything that would ever be said about Daggerfall in previews, showing how Daggerfall's development was a lot more straightforward than Arena's. These reports, however, did also show just how ambitious Bethesda was with Daggerfall, with some of the claims not being fully implemented or missing altogether. These reports talked of features like 18 pre-made classes and the possibility to create your own class. The player can pick from various advantages and disadvantages like phobias and illnesses. Interactive entertainment even mentioned having no legs. The player can choose popularity among certain factions. The player can become a vampire that can't act in daylight but has improved stats at night. Being a vampire will also make people react to you correspondingly. Buying and furnishing houses and even castles. There will be more items including 15 artifacts from arena plus new ones. An option to import arena characters. A beastery where you can look up monsters before you encounter them. A potion maker to create your own potions with ingredients. In-game notification icons which show if you're using a spell and underwater levels. Now, that is a lot, but for the most part, these claims were correct, which just goes to show how damn impressive Daggerfall is. This game came out in 1996, and gamers would be hyped about these claims today if they were made for The Elder Scrolls 6. Just take that in. In an interview with Peterson after the release of Daggerfall, he stated that there were even more planned Interestingly, these would actually become reality in later games in the series. These included conflicts between different factions with a real world impact, cities could be under siege, and all the important NPCs wouldn't just be sprites, but feel like living characters who would develop a relationship with the player. Man, this goes to show just how limited Le Fay and Peterson were by the technology of their time. In their heads, they were already thinking of games as grand as Oblivion or Skyrim, but sadly for them, the technology simply wasn't there yet. Over in the art department, lead artist Mark Jones and Louise Sandoval began work on concept art. These artworks and renders were used for the official Daggerfall website. 
Jones also created the Daggerfall logo, together with in-game characters and textures, while Sandoval would help with the hand-drawn characters and create the cover artwork. Joes proposed creating the sprites from 3D models, similar to Donkey Kong Country on the SNES, but Peterson and LeFay were sceptical, instead asking for them to be hand-drawn like an arena, as they feared them looking too origami-like. Not deterred by this comment, Jones secretly prepared some rendered sprites. When he showed them to LeFay and Peterson, they were amazed and allowed him to proceed with the renderings. Even so, a great deal of the sprites were already drawn by hand, resulting in Daggerfall having a mix of rendered and hand-drawn graphics. Mark Jones described his impression of Daggerfall's art style as mixed, but not surprising due to the fact that over two years of development, only about three artists remained in Bethesda, with high employee turnover meaning that 20 different artists worked on Daggerfall. Every now and then, Bethesda presented a new promotional box cover for Daggerfall. And boys, let's be honest here, box art from the 90s definitely has a unique feel to it. I'm not saying this doesn't look sick, because it does, but could you imagine Skyrim being designed like this? The first artwork was given to Computer Game World for the January 1995 issue, followed by the cover art in the CES cinematic, with another cover for the Interactive Entertainment issue 19 as well as a cover used in an interactive demo, then changing away from this blue cover to this black cover that itself had a variant where the Underking had full hair and one where the hair was more wretched, and then the final cover finally getting a new border, while the UK got its own cover. This may seem like a lot, but as a graphic designer, let me tell you that this many revisions is actually on the low side. In the 90s, fear over entertainment media causing violence in teens was at an all-time high. No longer was it metal music being the spawn of the devil, this time it was those god dang video games. The result was the ESRB rating system, which would later be a cause of concern for publishers, with a high rating making them believe it may affect sales. Of course, GTA and Call of Duty later disproved this theory, but in the 90s it was a legitimate concern and Daggerfall was not able to escape these new rules. As an anecdote, Ted Peterson mentioned the rating system in a later interview. I got a questionnaire for Daggerfall, which was obviously made for much simpler games. It asked questions like, is there nudity in this game? Yes. Is there bloodshed? Yes. Can an innocent person be killed? Yes. Can there be a reward for killing an innocent person? Also, yes. Needless to say, we got slapped with the worst rating for a game, and later, Lieberman listed us as being one of the top 10 worst corruptors of children. Of course, I'm sure that sold a few units. Thanks again to Frank Schlob and Moritz Ernst Jacob for their work in gathering together all of that information. Back to Daggerfall's actual release, and it literally improved on every single aspect of the first game. Better graphics, sounds, controls, RPG mechanics, you name it. Think of Arena as the beta for Daggerfall, with Daggerfall being the true realisation of LeFay's brainchild. Whenever you talk to a developer who has just created the first in a series and then immediately goes on to start the sequel, you will often hear, now we know how to make a game. Comparatively to Daggerfall, Arena was clunky difficult to control, had a severe lack of customizability, and while it technically gave you access to the entirety of Tamriel, your options of actual things to do there were limited. Without the same deadline pressures of Arena, LeFay and his team were able to take a full two years of development. By reusing the assets already made for Arena combined with the new X engine, they were able to jump straight into the game design upgrading their procedural generation algorithms to generate miles upon miles of terrain, and combining that algorithm with a set of pre-made city and dungeon tiles to create all of the locations the player can visit. It's truly a marvel what this small team could accomplish. With an option for a simple UI and built-in mouse luck, a relatively unusual inclusion in an RPG for the time, Daggerfall is the first game in the Elder Scrolls series that controls like a modern game making it still playable today, even for newer gamers. Its 90 plus page manual makes clear that Daggerfall wasn't simply a cash grab on the success of Arena, but instead a huge leap forward to create a breathtaking world. This manual covered just the basics the devs thought you should know before playing the game, 
and even then it barely scratches the surface. Unlike Arena though, an in-game tutorial of sorts is included, making this manual more of a handy guide for those who want to delve deeper into the game's lore. And there's a lot of it here, even including the family trees of the key royal families around the Iliac Bay. Marketing stouts it as the biggest world ever made, and for an impressively long time, this was true. And while we'll cover why the compact worlds of the sequels were the right direction in hindsight, it is still wondrous to be able to travel for miles on a map the size of the United Kingdom. 88,745 square miles in fact. Cities are a realistic size, not simple approximations. They house thousands of NPCs with hundreds of guild options, split into temples, knightly orders, mages guilds and so forth. So large was Bethesda's ambition that gaming journalists at the time worried about the effects such a lengthy development may have, with concerns of feature creep due to its absolutely colossal two year development. Bethesda would never make gamers wait that long again, right? Right? Oh god, please release a new game. Daggerfall was so large that it became Bethesda's first game to be exclusively pressed to CD, with not a single floppy disk version in sight. Although, they did send many a floppy disk patch out, because it's Bethesda guys, the initial release was marred by bugs and glitches galore. And only to perpetuate the stereotype that they would later become infamous for, no, of course they didn't fix them all. The game at first glance does look similar to Arena, but the graphics are now in full polygonal 3D, albeit with flat sprites. This means the player can take advantage of 360 degrees of movement and verticality, and it's used to its full potential here, making dungeons far bigger and labyrinthian than they honestly had any right to be. But we'll talk more about all that later on. Before the fame of Morrowind and its subsequent mainstream sequels, Arena and especially Daggerfall were like these secret gems that only hardcore CRPG fans knew about. The reverence for Daggerfall is almost unmatched compared to other RPGs released in the mid to late 90s. And that's for good reason. Compared to its competitors, it had introduced such revolutionary life simulator and fantasy RPG mechanics that would never truly take hold in any other series to this day, with rivals like Baldur's Gate or Fallout only offering a smidge of the depth that Daggerfall had. Julian Le Fay would go on to call it his most difficult project ever, and he says it nearly killed him. Ted Peterson also stated as much in his own interviews. Their efforts do not go unnoticed though. The Elder Scrolls Chapter 2 Daggerfall is a massive achievement for 1996. Some say it was too ambitious, and they are absolutely right. The technology just wasn't there yet. But even with this fact, the game makes up for it in so many other ways. If you watched to the end, leave the video a like and comment below your thoughts. Episode 2 to this Daggerfall analysis will be coming shortly, so subscribe so you know exactly when it releases. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Jeweler out.